Ambrose negotiator with the Army, sort of as we know as an expert on geostrategic affairs, trained in economics at Presidency College, Calcutta, and chairing New Delhi, he has worked as an energy economist in the past, besides serving as a consultant to FICCI's International Division. In 2017, he founded Delhi Defense Review, a think tank focused on the analysis of technology, world, and ideas. Sorov's book lies in a semi-academic space, a heavily researched non-fiction and a heavily researched analysis of where India's economy is headed post the pandemic while throwing light on other policy missteps like demonetization. Although Sorov examines the what and why of the situation in the book, he also addresses the how side of things. That is, how can India become a key engine of global growth? Economic concepts discussed are complex, but they're written in a manner that is accessible for an average reader to stay interested in economic matters of the country and what he can to understand them. Sorry, would you like to add something to it? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Let's talk about Jerry for a bit. Okay. Uh, yeah. Would you like to introduce yourself first? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Jerry Shi. I'm a journalist at the Washington Post here in Delhi. I help oversee our uh, coverage of South Asia. Uh, and previously, I was for six years uh, in China and before that in the United States. Um, and so I guess Sarah invited me probably because our interests overlap quite a lot. My experience, I think, you know, covering some of these countries uh, that feature prominently in his book uh, as well. Um, and, and I guess, just to say a couple words about the book, I found it um, very prescient because we are living in um, very uncertain economic times. That's the biggest story of today, arguably even bigger story than sort of what is happening in, in Ukraine. And the sort of conclusion of the medium term strategic implications. Um, for those of you who haven't uh, read the book, um, it's a wonderful and very comprehensive, um, and don't believe what she said, it's actually very sort of, it's, 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 it's definitely dense, believe me. As somebody who studies economics myself, I will say that it is indeed heavily researched. Um, Sara goes, I guess, location by location, and he breaks down the conditions um, that the world has seen since the last great financial crisis in the United States. In Europe, in China, and in Japan, I think, right? Those are the four sort of, the four main economic centers. The four main economic centers, and how we have, we have essentially experienced an unprecedented period of loose monetary policy um, and economic and political developments that have basically led us to this point today where there is no economically strong or arguably even militarily strong country. And that's the situation that India finds itself in, right? The US um, is experiencing very high inflation um, and China is, despite all its growth in the last couple of decades, it's essentially teetering on the edge of a catastrophic sort of debt crisis. Uh, Japan has been lethargic for decades. Uh, Europe is sort of driven by internal divisions. Half of it, you know, of the, of the, of the Eurozone and the southern part is, is basically insolvent and it's being propped up by the north, which wants to, to, to enforce austerity measures. And so in this world, you know, where is India going to position itself? How is it going to navigate these powers? I personally see this time, now, if we just discount all that's happening in Ukraine, I consider this an uh, extraordinarily perilous period, um, mostly because I agree with Sarov's broad point that I think the United States is definitely in decline economically, strategically. Not only that, but I would also agree that, that China is similarly on the decline. There are those who believe that the precondition for two superpowers to essentially 
go to war has to be that there is one power that is the sort of the, the everything and one is the in government and one is the like and one is rising. But not only that, I believe that the rising power, i.e. China, is also facing sort of domestic pressures that might push it towards uh, there are those in Washington, D.C. today who argue that it is precisely because of China's sort of internal pressures, the declining economy, rising discontent, that Xi Jinping will be forced into uh, an invasion of Taiwan. There are many people, particularly sort of the, 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 the conservative hawkish side of Washington who, who, who are quite firmly in that camp, and that's why you regularly see headlines out of D.C. saying the Pentagon or whoever believes that there will be a war in, in, uh, in East Asia you know, within the next five years. Anyway, enough of me talking. I, I, I want to ask you, Sar, uh, first of all, about why you wrote this book. And then, second of all, we have a lot of ground to also cover because you wrote this book before the outbreak of the Ukraine war, and obviously the world has changed a lot, um, and not only in terms of the, 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 the fighting that's going on, but also the inflation that has that it has uh, sparked um, everywhere. Um, and so, yeah, first of all, tell us why why you uh, why you put it. You know, the book has been a bit of a torturous process. It go on for years, and while the publisher didn't mention, it basically came to a play allegiance <laughs> in the process. <laughs> Be that as it may, the, because I see the, this is what I always uh, like to think is that you know a book is sort of it germinates within a book germinates within you. It sort of is nourished by your early impressions, fed by your fed by new data and experiences but is ultimately conditioned, shaped by your crystallizing worldview, right? So in my, in my worldview is that geopolitics and geoeconomics, you know, do not really lend themselves to a siloed approach. As far as the, uh, the, the, you know, the analysis of the world is concerned, you can't, you can't, you can't just put these in nice little boxes and, you know, the way we are doing it nowadays, but I think there's a clear melding of the two. And it is at the intersection of that that you know you can pass through trends and maybe identify or trends reveal themselves. So that is that is that is where I come from. And this is this book probably has been inside me for years on an end, even before I actually got down to writing it. So that is what I wanted to do. Instead of you know, I was writing a book with uh, it's about India and the world, so to speak. This is India's in, these are India's interactions with the world. I wanted to first examine the world as it were, right, and then situate India's place. That is the that is the reason why I have essentially written this book. Because usually, we in India, we don't really look outwards to see what is happening everywhere. We only look at what, what kind of transactions are going on, you know, bilateral or even multilateral transactions that involve us at some level. So that is, the and, and and you lay out very comprehensively. The economic and the sort of the, the grand strategic picture in the world leading up just to the pandemic. Um, obviously, since then, we've had the war in Ukraine. We've had skyrocketing inflation everywhere. Possibly, we're heading very likely. I, I think we were just discussing this before we started. The world um, is going to enter a, a sort of a, a, a global recession. So. Look at your crystal ball, and what is the next, I guess, six months, one year going to look at, look like? A, uh, in, I guess, in Europe, and, and all of the major powers that are involved, and B, what is the picture of the in India? Well, we have to go by the, to get the leading economy still, the United States. The book predicts that it will enter a recession, or at least at what is called a technical recession, when you have two quarters of, uh, you know, contraction in GDP, sooner than later, probably this year, and some are saying that has already happened, although that figure was contested, the figure for the last quarter, 
But there is nothing that the Fed can do to prevent what is the Fed, as in the Federal Reserve, which is the central bank of the United States, can do to prevent a recession now. It has to send the U.S. economy into what is called a hard landing to quell prices. Because you cannot have, you know, what is happening. What was the thing that was going on in the West before the pandemic? Okay, low inflation. You had low inflation and low growth. And this was the case in the United States. This was the case in uh, Europe, in the Eurozone, that is, the countries that use the Euro. And this was the case in Japan, and has been in Japan for decades, ever since the what was the end of the Hesei boom, what was called the Hesei boom, which sort of the Hesei bubble, which burst in 1991. After that, you had the lost decades of Japan's Hesei. So there's going to be a recession in the West, and that is going to push down aggregate demand on a, at a global level. That is going to have an impact on energy and commodity prices. I'll just say one thing, like in March 22, you had a lot of these analysts, some from Credit Suisse and other places, they were predicting a new commodity super cycle. Okay, like the one you had leading up to the global financial crisis. So a super cycle as in a huge uh, rise, you know, sustained rise in commodity prices. But that is not what has happened since then. Like, you, you, even crude has softened since then, right? So that is what we are going to see. We are going to see a further decline. We are not going to see... Because the, because the basis is not there. This is not 1970 anymore. In, in the 1970s, the Western economy and Japan were still together. Okay, they had just come to come, the, the golden age of capitalism had just ended. There had been, there had been a huge rise in productivity. There were, uh, and the rise had been through manufacturing. Whether in America or Japan, of course Japan was beginning to compete with America then, especially in the small glass segment and the rise of the uh, white goods industry, stuff like that. So we are going to see them return to a state. The best that America and Euro and Europe can hope for is low inflation. Very low growth accompanied with very low inflation. Okay. So that and that and China in any case, like you said, is at the edge of a precipice. What is going to happen is you're not going to see a Soviet style collapse. What we're going to see in China is Japanification. They're going to pour liquidity like no tomorrow to keep all these zombie enterprises afloat. And all that is going to land on the balance sheets of the commercial banks who are not going to lend. Right? So credit growth. See, basically all these economies, these monetary production economies that we live in, like Schumpeter has said, these are all credit driven essentially. And most of the credit is created by the commercial banking sector, your HDFC and state bank, etc. in India, right? They are the ones who create most of the money in this economy, what we call money. So, they, credit growth is going to go for a toss in China. In any case, according to one IMF report, the credit multiplier in China is close to zero. So putting in, pouring in more credit is not going to work in China's case anyway. So what you're going to see is a Japan-style freeze, where the, where the People's Bank of China and the government work together to just keep things as they are. And you can forget about this being you know, China driving the global economy forward. I'm saying it in a nutshell, I go into this in a lot of detail as you know. So, so, so if, if I understand you correctly, you're basically saying that the, we're going to enter a worldwide recession. And commodity prices will fall as soon as the war is over? Even they, are, they, are, they have declined even as the war is on. Right? They, are, they have declined even as the war is on. Because fact of the matter is that, see, Russia's timing was also very clever in that sense. They knew the world was already under inflationary pressure because of the, you know, the hurt that the supply chains had you know, gone through because of the pandemic. And all kinds of shortages, from containers to raw materials, because mining had stalled, lots of things are happening. Semiconductor shortage is well known. So they knew that they would get carve outs from the West. And they did get carve outs. Like they're still selling their oil through those carve outs, they're selling gas through those carve outs. And India has emerged as a major purchaser as well, right? So it's only a matter of time. As I see it, the oil producing nations of the world are recouping their losses right now. Because if you remember, futures trade in the food market, in, in Brent and all, had gone into negative territory in April 2020 and May 2020 when the, uh, the worldwide lockdowns happened. That's just how what manufacturers are also doing. Even though wholesale prices in India have declined, which is relevant to a an industry or a company or a producer, the consumer price inflation has still not gone down by as much. 
because they know they are because what companies are doing in India is they're pushing on, they are basically transferring whatever they can, they are passing on whatever they can to recoup losses. But it can't go on forever because the aggregate demand in India is also not very tight. So okay, so so you don't so you think that prices generally will come down. Uh, one area of, of great interest for me personally is what about food? Um, because food prices as we know have rising worldwide. This is a subject that that, that is and, and, and was of great interest to me earlier this year, because as we saw food prices rise due to the, the, the sort of the supply shocks in Ukraine, it reminded a lot of people of what happened in I think it was in 2008. Around that time, you can argue that there were years of very high prices that directly or indirectly contributed to the Arab Spring and political and political instability all around the world. And when I see things like what's happening in Sri Lanka, you know, we've seen protests over fuel prices. I think in in, in, in Tunisia, in Peru, there is um, concerns about uh, you know how prices might feed instability here in our neighborhood in, in Pakistan. Um, is that a concern? Whether it's food, whether it's oil, whether you know. That is definitely a concern, but of course, uh, see, it's like this. Food prices are linked to oil prices, because fertilizers are ultimately made out of either naphtha feedstock or natural gas feedstock, right? And oil and gas prices are still not oil and natural gas, they're still linked to each other, despite the best efforts of people to create a separate, uh, so what is called a spot market for natural gas. So that is one thing. The other thing is that Ukraine, the, like you mentioned, right, the Arab Spring, so a lot of people believe that Tahari Square basically started with a loaf of, loaf of bread or the lack of it, essentially, isn't it? So uh, that is one thing, but uh, uh, the problem is that Ukraine, a lot of these countries who are for whom the main calorific, you know, the calorific source is basically wheat, they were dependent on Ukraine, there's no doubt about that. And so I, I definitely think that, you know, if these problems continue, but, but, the, but the one thing is there, the Russian Navy, after the sinking of the Moskva, which was their flagship, Black Creek flagship, they're not really being able to block the Ukrainians the way they would like. And I think given the current state of landing on Odessa or something, may not be on the cards, right? Maybe, yeah, but it is a concern, because there, even if oil prices decline, as I think they will, food prices may remain sticky, you're quite right there. But then there's the question of fertilizers as well. So, uh, and uh, you know, one of the biggest suppliers of fertilizers is Russia itself, especially phosphatic fertilizers and all that. So yes, so that is definitely a concern. Food prices are a concern, no doubt. Okay, but let's shift slightly away from, I guess, Ukraine and talk about, I guess you would agree with my assessment that both the US and China are either in decline or say. What is India's sort of, as, as you, see it, and as you argue in your book, what is the, the, the path forward for India to sort of see that opportunity? See, it's, it's like this. Because the United States in, is in decline, it is no longer that forthcoming to create a new China by simply opening up its markets, right? So you have the Buy America Act and all that. But given the inflationary pressure that we see in the world economy, they will have to relent at some point. See, what has happened is they, they re removed uh, India from the developing country status and all the benefits that came with that, and so on and so forth. But you see, now, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and Mexico cannot substitute China's scale, even if I put them together. The only country that can replicate what China has done for the world in terms of acting as a deflationary force is India. The Indian worker can do it. The Indian worker has to step up. So for that purpose, and you know, I, I know that you know Piyush Goel and others said that we are staying away from, we, we are not, we are keeping the dialogue going but we are not joining IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Forum. But I see once certain concerns are dealt with, I actually see India going headfirst into that. And I also, I can, I mean this might be a slightly bold thing to say, but I see the United States eventually joining what is called, the, what was the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is now called the, you know, the Comprehensive uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, with Japan leading it, and it's already in place. It's the rival to China's RCEP. 
India has made its stand pretty clear by moving out of RCEP. It has said that I'm not going to be part of a China-like bloc. I'm not going to help the Yuan's rise in any way, essentially, the then you keep rise. So if in, and, and Europe definitely needs India. There's no doubt about it. See, Europe has a technology and trade partnership, over partnership only with two uh, countries. One is the United States and one is with India now. So that is, you see, the European Union is going to draw close to India. I see an India-EU free trade agreement happening before one happens with America. Because domestic politics in America, because of America's decline and the fact that, you know, inequalities of the charts and as I've written in the book, that the middle class is essentially either stagnant or declining, depending on how you see things. So, uh, because of that, no Amer American politics will not be very forthcoming on uh, signing on a, on a free trade agreement with India. But eventually they'll have to come around because of inflationary pressure. So India has to, in my view, India has to decouple with China and strongly get into an economic alliance with Europe and America, these two places. Um, so one question that I've always had, um, I guess, about India's future is, it's, it's, it's always seemed to me at a superficial level that India has a massive potential in manufacturing in that it is arguably the only way that you can absorb so many, I, I, I guess, you know, so, so many, so much labor, essentially. I mean, this country is blessed with a massive labor pool. And yet, it, we frequently hear arguments from um, policymakers, not in the current government, but, you know, for example, uh, Raghavan, Rajan Rao always argued that no India's specialty is its service sector. But to me, it seems like it's missing sort of a, a massive opportunity. Why cannot India replicate the success of Vietnam or China or, or, or South Korea? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so see, this is also one of the reasons why I wrote this book, right? This is precisely this question. So the thing is that uh, I actually support the performance link incentive schemes that the Australian government has started. In fact, I would say, I, my only point is that they should have started six years ago, right? But things have to, there have to be things that go along with that. And what has to go along with that is that you need far greater uh, collaboration between industry, academia, and the government. In fact, in the Indian government, you need a ministry that is similar to the mini, what MITI was for Japan. Although there are people who have done academic work and said that MITI wasn't all that it was made to be. The Ministry of, you know, basically industry and technology. So you're saying we need the Indian government yes. specifically so because we're pour our resources into, let's say, semiconductors and, and, and solar panels. And because if you want to be a country of people who make things, like the Japanese may turn themselves into monodosukuri, it's not enough to say make in India just like that and have a slogan about it. It requires, you know, granular level efforts where you go down to the component level, the six digit level basically, and stuff like that, and you uh, you work on the supply chain. Because you cannot become a manufacturing power if the value added, oh, I produced a refrigerator in India, great. But the compressor is from China. The door is from Vietnam. That was okay when the world was different from what it is now. That is not the world of today anymore. You cannot simply do the final processing. China realized this. China was also given this hand, was dealt exactly this hand. When it created the special economic zones of the East Coast, it was given this hand only. For 20 years, the value added for various in the industries which were supposedly made in China was less than 7-8%. You remember the iPhone, right? When the first iPhones came out, the value captured on Chinese soil was only 5% or 6%. But today that is not the case. Today, Apple is heavily dependent on China, and the iPhone 14s, which are going to be rolled down by in India as well, they, they are basically going to source their components from China. So you need to work very hard with small and medium scale industries, with academia, alongside whatever incentivization you are doing, like the performance linked incentive or strategic use of tariffs. It is wrong for somebody to say that tariffs don't work at all. Tariffs work, but if you strategically, whether it be Germany, whether it be the United States of America, whether it be France, all the followers of Great Britain in the industrial game 
all used uh, tariffs. Anybody can check their economic history and you will find they've used tariffs, they've used subsidies, they've used uh, quotas, exactly what China has done, right? Everybody has incentivized the growth of industry because it's very simple. If you don't make anything, what are you going to service at the end of the day? Right? Yeah, one manufacturing job, it's not a question of whether I will employ 15, 20 million people in manufacturing. It's more a question of the people who will be, you know, in associated services. When you talk about servification, in my view, servification makes it more contingent upon India to actually have a proper manufacturing estate. Because one washing machine is one manufacturing or two manufacturing jobs, but seven service jobs, services jobs. But just importing the uh, see imports also create jobs, okay? They create jobs at warehouses and things like that, but that is not enough. So you need the value multiplier of manufacturing. No country has become rich without manufacturing in the history of mankind, okay? Except maybe some funny money casino economy somewhere. That's a different matter. Maybe they, maybe tourism has done it for them. I don't know. I'm not against tourism. I think it's very important. It also has a lot of employment potential. But manufacturing is the key because manufacturing is not just manufacturing, it is design, it is, it is you know, marketing, it is also, and let's not say, you know, you can just have it made somewhere and we just market it here, it's not going to be enough. It's a different ecosystem altogether. And India, unfortunately, because of liberalization, uh, found it easier to tap services for growth. But we have tapped it for all we can. If we want our productivity to rise, if we want to uh, go past the middle income trap, we don't want to be st stuck in a situation where our per capita income rises from around, you know, 2300, 2400 now to just 7000 and we stay there. We have to get to the, uh, if you have to get to the sort of what the World Bank and the IMF call an upper income society, we have to move through that. And manufacturing is the key to that. Uh, I'm not even getting into strategic issues and, you know, uh, national security and those the arguments. I'm not even saying that. I'm just saying purely to sustain growth, we need manufacturing. I, I agree. I think it's simply because you need, as a country, India needs a, 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 a vibrant and, 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 and strong uh, in, uh, middle class as yes. an engine, right? Um, you know, today we see these incredible sort of you know class world leading um, internet companies, uh, you know, popping up at bank or whether and, and you know IPOs from. Paytm and Zamato, and you know they're really sort of you know, world standard. But how many people does that actually benefit? Oh, well, the wealth is accrued by just you know a, a tiny circle of tech guys in Bangalore, right? And, and so you know is that a sustainable way to kind of push this economy? Inequality will definitely become more and more of a problem if you just depend on services. See, it's like this. The World Bank has come out with a report which says that services can drive growth in India. But even that report which came out recently, talks about the importance of manufacturing, even that report, which is talking about how services can make a difference for India. I'm saying, great, maybe we don't need to produce at the level that China did, that will save our environment. Maybe if services are all that they are made out to be, then it's great, maybe we don't need to. And that is also good, because if we, if we become a one-horse pony or one-trick pony, that won't help us either in the long run. You'll see the same kind of problems you saw in China. But what we need to prevent is, we don't need another real estate bubble masquerading as growth. Okay, we, we have to create actual value in this country. And that is hard work. That requires the creation of industrial parks where you have plug and play. Today, when you go to an uh, industrial park in Hanoi, which is in the, in the north of Vietnam, you know, people can just come in and the utilities are assured, waste management is assured, Taxes are, of course, the, uh, India, by the way, India's corporate tax regime is quite attractive now because of the yeah. rationalization or, or, you know, standard which was done in 2019. And uh, there are certain kinds of labor laws. I'm not a votary of, you know, completely diluting on labor laws, but maybe we can make them of the kind that they are, they are, they are at the moment in Vietnam. We have, Vietnam has a well-defined set of labor laws. Maybe we can, you know, uh, take some inspiration from that. So you have that, and it's just plug and play. But India has an advantage. India's advantage is a whole lot of things are designed in India. They're not made in India, but they're designed in India. 
and this is not a joke, right? The latest cars are designed in India. The latest semiconductor chips are designed in India. If you take a sort of, if you take a poll, you find maybe even as high as 50% of them are being designed in India, right? In the various global the work work centers and all the centers over here. So that that thing is already in place. And what is happening is because of the complex nature of manufacturing and so and see another thing that manufacturing is is manufacturing services, right? Manufacturing services is a very high value creating proposition. So if you build something, you also have you have to design it, you have to conceive it, you have to develop it. Those generate a lot of high paying jobs as well, and then and then the downstream jobs all are taken together. Uh, okay, so. Uh, one last question, I think we should probably open it up, let people ask you some questions, but one last thing I wanted to touch on was, you know, this question that's, I guess, been at the heart of Indian foreign policy going back decades, right, of, you know, should we sort of, I guess, pick a side in the sort of the West versus the Soviet Union during the Cold War, um, India ended up treading more or less uh, sort of its uh, down the line path down the middle. Today we're seeing sort of the split again between the U.S. Um, and, and the China-led bloc. Um, what should India do, and what what do you sorry, what what do you think will happen, and what do you think India should? Do? Yeah, I've always said that rather than a strategic relationship, it is more of a trade relationship between the United States and Europe and India requires. If that trade relationship is forthcoming then India will gravitate towards the Western Bloc for sure. Because the enmity, I would, I'm using this word enmity, the enmity with China is now quite real. This is not the 1990s anymore or even the 2000s. But given what has happened, what happened in summer 2020 and happened in Doklam before that, China has clearly marked India as an enemy. And this, no matter whoever puts a or whatever spin on it, is not going to change. So India is going to decouple from China. The reason why you are not seeing a decoupling and you are actually seeing a surge in imports from China is because these PLI schemes that I talked about, they are increasing final processing in India. But the components are coming from China. Right? So you are seeing a surge in imports from China simultaneously, even as you are trying to make in India and all that. So which is why the, it cannot be emphasized enough that you need to develop a proper supply chain in India. There is something called in economics called minimum efficient scale. Okay. Now for one particular kind of industry, the minimum efficient scale might be the world. Okay, the entire world market is required for that uh, industry to be viable. This usually uh, leads to that being present in only one space. Okay, which is why you are seeing the semiconductor business basically being concentrated in a place like Taiwan. Because for years, the minimum efficient scale was the world for the amount of semiconductors that those fabs were producing. But now there are many more because of the internet of things and the growing guys because so many things are becoming software driven. When you say software driven, obviously you need the microchip in there, right? You need the IC. You can't have something software driven if it doesn't have processors of its own. And now even you know your dumb fridge is going to end up having three processors, right? And, uh, and uh, you're going to make sure that those fridges are everywhere because we believe in, you know, freezing stuff. So, the point of the matter is that the minimum efficient scale for, in my view, the semiconductor industry has now moved to a regional level. Regional markets can sustain semiconductor industries. So, you're going to see these, is that the time one? Okay, so you're going to see these, uh, somebody has gone So, you're going to see a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, chip manufacturing get redistributed across the world, and that is India's opportunity. The China's opportunity was late Cold War. America could not have uh, possibly kept inflation in check and simultaneously competed with the Soviet Union on the military industrial side and produced enough consumer goods. This is yet another opportunity that India has, which is why I support PLI, which is why I support this Ek Dhaka Ordo kind of. Formulation, give uh, uh, another push for manufacturing. Because the geopolitical climate has moved in such a way, and the geoeconomic climate also, that this is the last window. This is the last window for India to become a manufacturing nation. And to say that we should not take it, then you are just going to, India is going to become at best like Thailand. 
Okay, and then Thailand has a decent fair amount of manufacturing. Although, and, and look at what happened to Malaysia. Malaysia is around that $11,000 mark in per capita. One of the reasons was that the manufacturing growth in Malaysia got stunted over time. Although it's, they are trying to revive it again, but it got stunted. You don't want to get stuck there. If you want to move forward, you need to be a manufacturing and an R&D nation. There is no other way. Well, a lot of big ideas. Uh, thank you, Saurabh. Thanks for, for the talk and, uh, and, and the book as well. I encourage everybody to read it because there's a lot more of these big ideas where um, in the book, so so thanks guys. Um, should we take some questions? Certainly, Jerry. Okay. Thank you for being a patient <laughs> this last <laughs> uh, Anyone? Oh, we have plenty of hands in there. I think I should. I think I am out. Yeah, you should be audible to that. The live stream. So you can come here and ask the question. Right. Let, me, let me just give you a text. We can use that mic. That mic works. Alright. Uh, so, well, thank you for the talk. Sir. Um, what I wanted to know was, so since your book focuses so heavily on the intersection between economic issues and strategic issues, this is a more broad-based issue, but uh, how exactly do you see, so if you talk about strategic issues and India navigating its way in this new world where both the major superpowers are seem to be declining, so uh, firstly, what, what role should India envision for itself? Like, does India envision to replace either of these or to have regional primacy? Uh, what exactly is the ultimate aim of what we're doing? And secondly, um, just link to that, to achieve our goals when we do these, when we uh, make economic progress and we make the right policies, such as uh, like policies like PLI and joining the ASVT agreements to make India a very manufacturing nation and reach a certain uh, stage of development. How does that help us expand our strategic choices and our scope for foreign policy so that we can achieve those uh, foreign policy aims in this paradigm? Oh, okay, are you aware of the debt free hypothesis? No, I'm not. Okay, you have to basically, it's from Alice in Wonderland. You have to run fast enough just to stay where you are, right? <laughs> and then the point is that so India has to run faster still. That is what I am saying. Now, the thing is that manufacturing gives you a world of options. One of the things that is, it gives you an option is, for instance, it will help you produce weapons faster, much faster. And although you may have developed good weapons, which despite all the stuff that you hear, we have managed to develop, which is why they are even being, you know, entertained in various international competitions, whether in Malaysia or, uh, in fact, the Tejas was down-selected in Malaysia. But if you have to say produce the Tejas quickly, you need to have a proper supply chain. 65% or 60% of the Tejas is uh, indigenous by value, but the engine is not, right? Okay, tomorrow the radar will be, stuff like that. Then you go down to the component level, you will find that India has managed to indigenize many things. But even now, you only have a few companies making something like a PCB, right? And uh, obviously you make no commercial grade microchips here at all. You just have some strategic fabs which are used for specific programs. Like semiconductor lab chunking and stuff like that. Okay. So the bottom line is it gives you options. People need stuff in this world. Right? You can you can be a Russia and say that boss, all I'm going to export is gas and certain kinds of weapons. In fact, America is almost there as well. <laughs> so uh, the, that's the thing. I'm kidding. America is present across the supply chain. I mean, when you talk about uh, semiconductors, you say, oh, okay, America has only a 12% share of semiconductor manufacturing, but every semiconductor that has made has American intellectual property and used at various levels, from the machine that has made it, the lithography machine, to the software that has been used to design the chip. Say, like a company like Cadence, that's an American company that provides most of the chip designing software. So they have IP, right? They knew what was important. So that is what makes the difference. This world is a cold, dark place. Let us make no mistake about it, okay? And unfortunately, the only thing that people have understood in this world is the currency of power. India's spirituality has not been understood by the world, unfortunately. Even people in India have let go of it now, as you can see, by what is happening in our country. So, so that, is the, that, that is the point. 
Manufacturing will give you options. It will give you. It will help you make weapons better. It will help you sell weapons to others. When you sell a weapon to somebody, it's not selling them a football. Okay. I mean, it's a bit like selling a football in the sense that they'll go and play with those weapons as well. <laughs> but the point is that you will. You are essentially going to have control over them. You, the media is full of oh, we imported the Rafale from France. We imported a lot of French influence along with the Rafale. Let us not forget that. Every time you try to upgrade the Rafale, you are going to go back to Dassault. Every time you try to add a new weapon, you have to go back to Dassault. And they are going to charge a bomb for it. Okay, and I am sure Dassault is hearing this. <laughs> so th that is my answer. Right. <laughs> long back Not anymore. So I go into detail. I go into a fair bit of detail on this in the book. They came off for BRI for two reasons, essentially. One was they already had a lot of overcapacity industries, especially old ones like cement and steel. Look at just look at the steel production figure, which is the number two producer of steel in the world. Our great country, Republic of India, or going to touch 150 million tons, higher than Japan or the United States. Which is the number one producer in the world? China. Already over a billion tons of steel production annually. Okay. So that's seven times, almost seven times our figure. And that is completely unsustainable. They just don't have that kind of demand for those industries anymore. So they have to export overcapacity. They also thought that along with our export of overcapacity, because we will also we will also create a global supply chain. And then later on they wanted to internationalize the standards. The, 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 the rarefied heights of manufacturing belongs to, the, belongs, belongs to those com uh, companies and countries who set international standards. So Japan, United States of America, Germany, they have a, they have a disproportionate hold on manufacturing, the world's manufacturing enterprises. Another sad reality. And we don't manufacture, so we can't set the standards. Another reason why you need manufacturing, right? So, so what I said the theme here. Yeah. So what happened then was the the Chinese had to export. The second thing was they had to internationalize their currency. They saw what America did to Japan in the 1980s. America, we have seen this movie before, by the way. America has already dealt with one challenger to its power, called the you know the, the Japan essentially. The old empire of Japan it dealt with in a war, nuked it also, and then it dealt with the successor economically. So you had all those plaza accords and things like that. So China knew that its rise could not be peaceful vis-a-vis -vis America. It had to make show its hand. And the Belt and Road, which was the Silk Road, the economic belt initially, it, it was basically that. See, China cannot liberalize its capital account. If you cannot liberalize, he would know him by, he's a banker by the way. So if you can't liberalize your capital account, your currency cannot be internationalized. Why the hell would I invest in your currency if I can't take it out of your country when I want to? So what is the other way to do it? I go around extending loans to everybody. Take loans from me, keep some of my currency, use some of those, uh, those loans to buy things from my manufacturers in my currency, right? And then if I can get enough companies, uh, enough countries hooked on to this, then they will also start uh, maybe transacting in yuan. I hold yuan, you hold yuan, China has given both of us yuan, maybe we should also transact in yuan, that sort of thing. But that is much more difficult than done. The network effects of using the dollar. Network effects as in, you know, because everybody is using the dollar, it makes sense for me to use the dollar as well. Overcoming those network effects is not so easy. And the BRI could not do that. And now what has happened, even before the pandemic, BRI investments were slowing down. If you see the year-on-year -year figures, after the pandemic what has happened is many of these recipient countries, they are in the real mess. 
Okay, they are in no position to now have these loans burdened on them. Their external balances are so weak. So China has dialed back immensely. So BRI is not going to do the trick for them anymore. That is my view. Thanks, sir. I'm looking forward to reading this. Just a quick question. For 75 years, for a variety of domestic constraints, India has been unable to create a manufacturing base. Are you optimistic that there's an inflection point now that these political constraints, other constraints to manufacturing in India, there's a chance that it can be resolved? I think so. See, I'll tell you this. Even despite the weaknesses that India had, India is still one of the top 10 manufacturing countries, by the way. Even then, right? It has, its output is not uh, insignificant. It's in the 400 billion dollar plus range. But that, that's not going to cut it for India. It has to be in the $2 billion range. So, but I think the window is here because the geopolitical opportunity is here. These policies are being put in place. But like I said again, merely putting in place a PLI scheme is not going to make you a manufacturing hub. It takes a lot of hard work where academia, bureaucrats, the bureaucracy, and the manufacturing estate has to come together. Right? And you have to create the right infrastructure. Simple reason. You go to any industry body, they will tell you that India has a disability. The term used is a disability. It has a disability of 9% vis-a-vis Vietnam and about 8, 7 to 8% vis-a-vis China. Basically, it means anything you make in China is by 8% cheaper and anything Vietnam is 9% cheaper. The PLI schemes have been advanced to basically tide over that disability, create larger scale in India and bring down prices. Okay, because in manufacturing, most manufacturing industry scale matters. But then the but then securing the supply chain matters even more in today's scale, world scale. And securing critical materials. We are talking about moving into EVs. Where's the lithium on our soil? We need Argentina and Bolivia. And China has been poking around in those countries for quite some time now. But of course, Argentina has its own reasons to be friendly with us, so maybe we'll get that from them. So you have to, you have to, you have to ensure that disruptions don't happen, right? What the pandemic has shown. So that has to be put in place now. We have to basically get the critical supply chain for both materials and machines in place. Another problem: we do not be produce anything in this country which can be. Uh, we do not produce, you know. Uh, even say five axis machine tools. We only produce three axis machine tools. Japan has been producing nine axis machine tools forever. <laughs> they are, they are, they are, of course, that is the world leader I'm talking about, but still. But so the machines that build machines, we don't produce them. We don't even do enough R&D on that. We had Hindustan machine tools, which had produced some very good machine tools by the, for the 1980s, you know, by the standards of the 1980s. But then GE offered some imports and that effort was just stopped. And this is a reckoning story in India. So the R&D story has to also be in place simultaneously. You just don't give up on what you have already built. You cannot go to next generation technology without producing this generation technology at scale. You can in a theoretical sense in a lab, but you have to climb the value chain like this. This constant talk of leapfrogging will not happen. So we have to get in. We have to get in. The window is there. The geopolitics is in place. The incentives are falling in place, but there's a lot of hard work that has to be done. And industrial parks have to be created, which are plug and play. Nobody, and you have to create ports where you can evacuate stuff in, in a day or two. You see, because the export market will be very important for what I am proposing. Both will happen. Import substitution will happen, because you will substitute a lot of Chinese stuff you are buying. And export promotion will also happen. So yeah, I think it can. Yeah, this is where I need a moderator because I don't want to see him uh, be, you know, picking favorites or whatever. I mean, <laughs> okay, let's start. Yeah. 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 So, uh, two questions. Firstly, so we've seen a lot of rhetoric. We've seen a lot of rhetoric from this government about the minimum governance, fact, a minimum government, maximum governance, about ease of doing business. And but we also see, I mean, uh, keeping aside these, uh, the pandemic and the Ukraine war, we see the 
eight quarters of uh, economic slowdown before the pandemic and demonetized GST. And also some people say the share of private investment in the Indian GDP has not risen despite all this rhetoric. So what, what are your thoughts on this? And secondly, do you think we need political opposition in the uh, by industrialists, by capitalists to make the economy function better? Because right now I don't think there is any opposition to the current government in the uh, in the economic sphere. Like there was Rahul Bazaar, but he died, and there is no other opposition to the government's policies. Yeah. Okay. So let us look at let's break this down. The, what is the real problem facing the Indian economy? And not from now, since 2012. The investment cycle is at a trough. Okay, years have gone by and investment has not picked up. And what, unfortunately what happened because of the demonetization shock and the way GST was implemented and the fact that the RBI delivered a couple of rate hikes in 2018, you would remember. And that was because of you know, the external balance. It didn't take off for another four years, right? A lot of people talk about you know uh, the one uh, Columbia professor was saying that our potential growth rate is eight percent. It is not. It is not eight percent. Even the RBI will say it's closer to six percent now. That is what our real GDP potential growth rate is because of what the flat line, you know, because of the impacts that happened earlier. Uh, that this book is about that. I'm talking about how to enhance it because we need growth because we still have a poverty problem in this country. Right, so that is one thing. As far as, demo, as far as politics is concerned, you cannot have a democracy without an opposition. Right, so whoever is interested in democracy will obviously want a strong opposition in India. I want a strong supposition, I want a strong opposition. I don't want a situation where both are weak and trying to seem strong, okay? <laughs> that, that is what is the real state of affairs, despite what it seems like. Which is why you are seeing all kinds of non-issues being the main focus of today, you know, and all kinds of societal issues being raised when the real issue for economy for India is the future growth and development of the Indian economy. Right? There, can be, there can be no two doubts about it. When you, when you go down, even anecdotally, if you go through the streets of Delhi, you will find the number of people living under flyovers, the number of people who are uh, without a home now has increased and during the pandemic, I personally interacted with two or three people who had just lost their homes. They couldn't afford the rent and their Matan Malik in some gaum had turned them out. This is the stark reality. Right, so the thing is that, but you are not going to address this by welfareism only. Some amount of direct support has to be given to the underprivileged. I am never against it. In fact, that free food, free ration scheme was the right step, giving rations to 800 million. In fact, if you see it, Initially, more may have been given, more direct transfers would have been given to the poor. But ultimately, government spending has to move towards growth enhancement. And that requires spending on infrastructure, that requires spending on R&D, that requires spending on obviously healthcare and education also, because the human capital aspect matters. So that is the that is where we are right now. We are we are not with the in the, the investment, the decline, the investment trough has been there for over almost a decade now. And that is why you are seeing the unemployment problem also. You see, when we say how do we address unemployment in India, you have to kickstart private investment. You know, Sita Raman was practically begging the, the corporate houses to invest the other day. I'm sure you saw that in the paper, right? That we have all these incentives in place. That is correct. You have reduced the corporation tax rate in 2019 to something which is quite competitive with any place in the world. Right, you have now got these PLI schemes. So now obviously Indian and now the banks are also not over in the state that they were. Indian commercial, the other thing that happened, and here I'll cut some slack to the current government, is that, uh, you see, in that in the, in the wake of the global financial crisis, when because of timely stimulus, supposedly, the Indian economy actually grew that year by 3.5 to 3.7 percent real GDP growth when the whole world was in a decline, in recession. India was one of the few countries that avoided the recession. But what happened was the stimulus measures which were put in place then were not withdrawn. And by 2010-11, the Indian economy had reached a euphoric state. 
you know, real estate was uh, super hot, especially people would remember in NCR and other places. And banks, especially our state-owned banks, they were practically running after people to give them loans. And that, that's how we got laden with this non-performing loan problem in India. And the IBC that was put in place, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, was the right step to clean that up. But the IBC itself needs to be tweaked because it takes a lot of time to remove bad loans, but we have done that. To a great extent, bad loans have been removed. So it's not like banks are not willing to lend right now. The engines can be fired, but social stability has to be maintained. Right, so that is the zone. Who else had a question? I think this chapter should be waiting. Yeah. I'll just wrap up. Okay, we have Dupali asking the first one. Oh, yes. Then we don't know. I don't know if it even makes sense, but how your idea sounds so fantastic. How do you get policy makers to listen to you? I, you know, this is another no, thing. This goes to the, this goes to what he said. You know, how do you make policy makers to uh, listen to you? You join them, then. you join their party, and you become a part of their party, and then you try to influence things. That is not how I, I see don't things. Think, I don't see you in that role. But uh, but I'll uh, but uh, yeah, the dance was a thing. See, ultimately, if you want to, if you want to have affectations to influencing policy, you have to be a policy maker, right? You cannot really say. Although, let me say one thing: some of the things that I have been shouting out about over the years are now coming to pass. Like, as you know, that indigenization has been a thing for me, mm -hmm. and then in 2020, this whole Atman Nirbharta thing started, and now finally things are happening. Manufacturing, maybe. I have actually called for these kinds of schemes for many years. Now, whether anybody is listening to me or not is a separate matter. We said to hope to people. No, that, 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 that I think uh, people do sort of sift through my stuff. Okay. But uh, I, I will not claim that you know they are greatly inspired by me or something. <laughs> the we need to say get that. Inspired, right? <laughs> uh, I can only write what I think is the truth. Cannot as a writer, I cannot, you know, think that I'm going to influence this or that. That is not why I wrote a book or write a book. Sort of very interesting uh, discussions. I just wanted to, uh, you know, summarize one thing you mentioned. You're, what you're talking about is transformative change, a radical change, which also should have a little bit to do with the mindset that we have in this country in terms of bringing in new technology and manage that kind of uh, resources. Um, could, you, could you tell us what are the three things you would say could enable the environment for people to really go into manufacturing and, and do you think there is a systems thinking process that is missing in this country? Because we do things because we want an effect on an objective without thinking what impact it will have on other stuff. So I think sometimes when I have conversations, I feel that people are thinking in a linear fashion rather than a holistic systems uh, way of looking at these kind of, because if you want transform transformative change, you have to, you know, change other things al along the way. So three enabling factors that you think will really hit the uh, stuff on manufacturing. One thing is you have to increase your expenditure on R&D. And it has been found that government spending increases crowds in private sector spending. Whether through your CSR or other things, you have to incentivize private spending on R&D as well and government spending on R&D. You have to do that. You cannot have manufacturing without having R&D in place. It just won't happen. If you just uh, look to you know, capture lower end industries of uh, say, you know, textiles and stuff, but when textiles now has got a whole R&D element to it. Bangladesh is not going to go very far unless it can move up the value chain. It has come a certain distance with textiles only. So one is we need a core focus on R&D. You are graduating more engineers than any other country in the world. And you can't employ them. Right? Why the hell are you graduating so many of them? Right. The, the reason for that is very simple. You don't have a manufacturing estate, proper manufacturing estate. So these guys go into whichever avenue they want to. You are most of them, so you have to have the R and you have to focus greatly on R and D, and you have to have that industry academia collaboration. You have to kick it off now, and within five or six years itself, you start seeing a lot of change. That is the one thing. 
The second thing that you need to is that you, as you are as a country, you need to have a clear focus on where you want to be. Like you were asking, where do you where do you see yourselves in the years ahead? Surely our agenda should be to have a country where nobody goes to bed hungry. That should be our first agenda, right? Has to be. And the second agenda should be that given such a large country with so many people, it should be a country that is at no time under geopolitical duress from anybody. It should not be the case that somebody can threaten our security when we are this big. So it also means that we must focus on developing the tools, the wherewithal necessary to protect ourselves. And that is the other thing. Those industries, whether you know, that people are very concerned about things like a military industrial complex. But if you are a large country, you cannot do without one. Otherwise, you will then be dependent on imports, which is far worse. Which is a much worse place to be dependent on. When you when you basically subsidize the military industrial complex from other country in a bid to defend yourself, and that has high second order effects because you know. Defense industries require manufacturing excellence. I know of companies that have contributed to the Tejas program, which are now green channel suppliers to Boeing. Right? So that is how things work. And you know, companies in Hyderabad and Bangalore and places like that. So that's the one thing. There has to be the vision in place. What, what our vision is basically. The R&D has to be in place. And the third thing is we have to have smart alliances in place. But for those smart alliances, we have to be clear about what we want and what we are willing to give. Right now, we I don't think our people are that clear. They are they they are looking at these transactional relationships everywhere. But what I would say is that if this 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 is checked, then I would be willing. I have always been a voter of hard alliances. See, either you don't, but if you do, then do a hard alliance. This touchy feely, I am part of that. I was seen here, then I was seen there the next day, and uh, some other venue on the third. It will not work in this world anymore. It will not scare your enemies, and neither will you get what you want out of it. Right? So, so you have to be clear. Either you stay away altogether, or you go in there full on. Those are the two options now. So these are the three things I would say that can change the matter. But like I said. Unless and until the United States and Europe are willing to enter into a trade alliance with India, proper trade alliance, the so-called strategic alliance will not go very far. It will be the same thing. It will be a lot of discussion. It will fill a lot of think tank seminars and stuff like that. But it will not amount to it. Well, in my considered opinion. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you were, you were wanting to follow up. Hello, sir. Uh, I had one question. So, even that you've talked about this window of opportunity that India has now, so if India uh, fails to take this window, then is there some other con country which could take its place? Or even if it succeeds to, is there a possibility that a new competitor might arise aside from the existing ones? Competitors will always arise. You think one day Africa will not have its chance? That it's only India that will rise on the world stage and that will be the end of it. There are 54 African Union entities and uh, uh, may have, a few of them actually, have, not few, more than a few, have per capita incomes which are higher than India's. The only problem with it is that they are not united. The problem with Sub-Saharan Africa is not united. But suppose you had a united Sub-Saharan Africa, but I'm talking in very general terms, a sort of Batu, Batu alliance, you know, or Batu people alliance or Batu people. And suppose they were given nuclear weapons by somebody, then you will have a new power on the world stage. Also with one that has access to two oceans, right, on this. So it is. it would be incorrect for us to think that competitors will not arise. But the question is, will you shape their rise or will you just wait around for them to arise? The United States does not believe in waiting for people to be to become peers, right? It it dealt, it has dealt, it has shown that time and again, which is why China has also failed ultimately. China will not emerge as a peer to the United States. It will decline. It is already in decline. It is just not that apparent right now, but it will become more and more apparent in the coming quarters. Russia is basically a, a different kind of entity. 
and with its uh, actions in Ukraine now essentially Russia who is also failed. So what is left then? So this is the other thing I'm saying. If we go through 15, 20 years of growth and not disruption, as we have seen in the last few years and all, and if we go through 15, 20, India goes through 15, 20 years of growth, then we're ready to understand that America will see India in a very different light than it does now. Now it may see it as a balancing tool for its own purposes. But 15, 20 years down the line, if India is successful, it will try to do the same thing <coughs> to India that it has done to Japan and China before us. So that, that also we need to be clear about. Whether we whether that or not is a whether the weather the question. But if we weather 2040, 2050, and India is still intact in one piece, then the question will be is how India will manage the rise of some African channel. That will be the real question. But I have seen that far out. Could well be that we all die in nuclear holocaust or something worse. Or maybe we die through multiple kinds of uh, pandemics and, you know. Can you know, stop and, being so grim? But whatever. <laughs> but if, we do, if we do see that, uh, you know, that some of that Sunhera Bharat Varsh or Sapnoka Bharat Varsh that Adam Kiyari used to say, then that will be our main concern. Because uh, Latin America, I don't see a challenger coming from Latin America. Their demographics, their position in the world, you know, even if Brazil and Argentina come together, etc., they're not going to be able to compete. I see Africa as the future because of the demographic sheer demographic power of Africa. The only place where the population will continue to grow, whereas it will be in decline everywhere else in the world. And I'm not saying that demography is destiny. Demography could be in riots and food shortages also. Okay, but, but if they can come together. Yeah, and they can they can be together. Then yes, I think that is where the superpower of the 2070s will be from. Maybe Nigeria on steroids, you know, because Nigeria is, according to some projections, Nigeria is going to end up with 800 million people by the end of the century. <laughs> and they produce great writers. So. They produce better writers than yeah. India, I must say. We look at okay, no, I no offense to become state, I guess, but uh, if you look at the others, uh, Africa has definitely produced better literature than India in the last 50, 70, 60 odd years. Right. You got to say something. Yes, sir. Should we say maybe one more? One more we have two questions. Should we club them? Okay. Yeah, two questions, and then, then yeah, one for one free, is it? Okay. Yeah, India is on. You can, you want to be on the media, please. You want to write this up here. So, if you want to, like if you want to come down, then you will have to push the other side of the question. And that has to go, since you want to manufacture, you have to expose it. And go through the dye side and the exposure. I want to be on this side. Firstly, on priority, you should Media export capability. I think India's limited export capability must must be less than one big port in China or something. No, no, not not a few. Not any more. But that was the case. Yeah, yeah, not so any more. Yeah. You would have to have clusters in say Odisha. Or other people, especially. Yeah, or other people. Yeah, number one. So that you have to push a lot for the export capacity. capacity. Secondly, if you want to have an investment, we have a very robust and attractive monetary policy. So that has to be a trade-off there, because that might also lead to some kind of problem. Number one. Number two, if you want to expand so much in manufacturing, you need massive amount of money. And then you can't run out of coal. You can't run away from coal. You can't run away from coal from coal any. No, but you will have to the peak, you have to uh, delay your peak. So either you, the conflict of interest arises in the Ukraine is a very paralysis in that, you'll have to also build up simultaneous renewable energy capacity. Nuclear. 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 You have to build up nuclear if you want manufacturing. India has thought, you need to build third and fourth generation nuclear for sure right now. But do we have capacity for that? Yes, we do. And if, if we are pushing for renewable energy, we are again dependent on China. You want, that is the whole thing, see, okay, just the answer, I will say the first part first. You want to go into green hydrogen, but the electrolyzers are not built in India, right? So you need to have manufacturing capacity in electrolyzers, otherwise your whole green hydrogen push 
can come on stack. You can't, you don't want to substitute one import by another. That is what you need to avoid. But as the first thing that you said, yes, the share of consumption in India's GDP will go down a little bit when you boost investment, because that is how things are. But to kickstart the investment cycle, to kickstart the investment cycle, you will need consumption to hold strong, which has not been holding strong for the last 10 years as much as we wanted, and so it has not taken off. It's a, it's a positively reinforcing cycle. If consumption is high, capitalist says, yes, I want to service this consumption. Makes an investment, takes a loan from a bank, makes an investment. Makes an investment, generates jobs. Those guys say, okay, now I work hard, I want a salary, what the hell do I do? Let me have some basking dogs. Consumption right there, okay. More consumption, more investment. That is what you want. You want a positive uh, reinforcement. So that will happen. The second thing that we talked about port capacity is very correct. You cannot have a turnaround day of five days at some port. You need it to be in line with the, the of course, Chinese ports are not at that turnaround time right now. And that, that is one of the reasons for global inflation. Okay, stuff is just lying on Chinese ports. Take any satellite image, you see it. Okay, so you need really good ports. You need linkage to ports. You need industrial parks sited right next to ports. Right, so that you don't waste any time evacuating stuff from the industrial park to whichever foreign destination you have. So all this is basic stuff, you have to put it in place, I started by saying this. And what is the third thing you said about the energy requirement? So see, there have the, uh, India's energy efficiency has actually improved. So you need to, even on the manufacturing side, you are not going to produce things the way you produced them in 1970. Right, so the energy intensity of manufacturing growth may not be the same as it was in the past. But there will be a very real need for base load power. And I also agree that coal is very much a part of the equation. You cannot give up on coal just like that, you might as well give up on industrialization then. Because you haven't been able to pick up on, but so what do you do with that? So even in this country, with the DAE, Department of Science and Technology and the Ministry of Power, they have developed an advanced ultra supercritical plant which reduces CO2 emissions by as much as 20%. Okay, and a uh, demonstration plant of 800 megawatt heat capacity was supposed to be built. You'll find it in the papers from 2018. But it has still not been sanctioned. Okay, so you see the point about R&D matters over here. You have to actually do the R&D and build stuff. So you have to, once you, there are new technologies which can reduce emissions from coal by an appreciable amount and if you get into things like carbon storage and stuff like that, carbon sequestration, but that is frightfully expensive even now. So yeah, but you can't help it. You have to, see, development and I want to feed everybody is always a fraught proposition. Let us be clear about this. It will lead to environmental degradation. It will lead to, this whole notion of green growth is misplaced. Green growth is not, is something on paper even now. So you either, uh, you know, it, and it will always be a case of, you know, us sitting in a nice place, uh, you know, with the ventilated air, basically uh, cooled air and having nice stuff and talking big, and the poor guy on the street saying, boss, why was I denied, okay? This question is always there. This question will not go. Okay, one more. Uh, last one. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so my question was about, so when we talk about uh, government, uh, building the manufacturing sector in India, part of what we we'll also need is uh, support from the government in terms of so building infrastructure. But uh, when you take a look at the data from the last 8 to 10 years, from 2014 or so, uh, what has been some more of a secular trend in how states have compost the expenditure is that the share of social sector expenditures, the social service expenditures have gone, has gone up, whereas economic services has trended down. And, and this is almost always the case with all states. Some cases it's me and here and there, but, but this is the secular trend. Uh, and when we talk about performance limits in sanitary systems, and there's multiple signs of building manufacturers in India, given environmental laws and all of those things. Why is there a sort contract contrast in the expenditure compositions made by state governments and the union government when uh, the objectives uh, are objectives mandating to do something totally different altogether. Yeah, you are right. See, state governments unfortunately are too driven by politics. So it's not surprising that social sector spending has held steady or even improved in some of the states. 
right? If you have any number, like in Bengal, you have a scheme called Punesh P and stuff like that. If you have any number of schemes which are aimed at social sector improvement, gender rebalancing, those are obviously required to deny it. But the point is that the overall agenda has been that, you know, we are going to just be in services. So we need more people who know, who are computer literate, basically. That has been the overall thrust of this country. Increasing computer literacy. So that you can then, you know, the, uh, handle a teller machine, or you can use an app and stuff like that. It's totally in a good state. Without Zomato and company, you would have been in a much worse off state right now. But it's not going to be enough. It's just not going to be enough. Right? So it again comes down to that. States which are keen, and another thing, the fiscal situation of the states of India is not very good, as you know. See, a local government or a state government, it has to stick to sound finance. It cannot have a functional view of finance, okay? A state government does not issue its own currency. That is issued by the central government. The state government does not have the central bank really backing it. Although the, the RBI has been extending ways and means advances and has extended loans also during the pandemic to state government. So it has done that. It has given them support. But so, so that thing will always be there. So they are, it's not surprising that they are focusing on the social sector. Right? They are focusing on the social sector more. But you know, I'll tell you something. I have talked to people in the industry. And all these skill development programs that you have, they are not, they don't really think much of it. Very big industries, they say, yeah, yeah, you got the skill development thing, but we are going to train you on the job anyway. Okay, so it's better that we have more and more people who can employ for training. So you need investment. So that's the thing, investment is heavily required. Investment and manufacturing, and that's what I do. Right. Okay. All right, well, thanks, Saurabh, for a wonderful discussion. We touched on pretty much everything, I think, from foreign policy to politics to economics to trade. That's like an Indian Adda, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think talk about everything under the sun. Everything under the sun, I think, but one it's conclusion. Always, there's nothing to worry about. So one conclusion I think we all agree on is that um, Saurabh, or whatever prime minister, <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so listen, I do not want the premature demise, okay? <laughs> <laughs> there is no way I'm running for anything. Except running from you for proposing such stuff. Why is the way you know it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody.